Today on another edition of Seahawks Forever with yours truly, Dan Viennes, powered by BetUS, we're going to take a look ahead to the Seahawks' first preseason game tomorrow against the Chargers in Los Angeles at SoFi Stadium, and we're going to do it with someone who watches the team up close every single day, Corbin Smith, longtime friend of the show, one of the hardest working guys out there. He's going to come and give us his frontline vision and experience and input on what he sees happening on this roster, some of the key position battles battles, some of the back-end battles at the bottom of the roster, some players who were poised to make names for themselves and stand out in this preseason environment. We've seen guys do that in the past, who are some names that will pop tomorrow. And at the top of the roster, Mike McDonald says the starters are going to play. They're going to play more than Pete Carroll been playing them the last few years, but how much will they play and what can we expect to see from them scheme-wise? Corbin Smith joining me next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast, in-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. If you're into live wagering, BetUS is the best around. You can click that link down below to get your account today and BetUS We'll give you a 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits up to $2,000. That link, once again, down below. Meanwhile, hit the, hit the thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Smash that like button, as they say. Subscribe to the channel. Closing in on 7,000 subscriptions. Help me get there before the start of the regular season. And also hit that bell button so you never miss new notifications of new episodes. If you prefer audio podcasts, I'm on all the platforms. You can subscribe there as well as leave a rating or a review if you like what you hear. Uh, been talking to Corbin for a long time. We've done a lot of content together. And uh, stick around till the end when we talk a little bit about his career. Um and just love what he does, love how hard he works, love how consistently he produces content and posts both on all Seahawks and on his daily podcast Monday through Friday on the Locked On Network, on Locked On Seahawks. Um, this is when we start to get more answers, right? It has been what feels like one of the longest off-seasons we've had in a long time because everything has been so new, right? So much change. In, in moving on from Pete Carroll, new coaching staff, the coaching search, different free agency process um, to some extent. It, obviously, same process being run by John Schneider, but looking for different players. Um, those same questions leading into and throughout the draft, how the offseason would be administered, how interviews are different. It's, it's all so uniquely different than it was before. Gives us a lot more to talk about with each other, right? Certainly gives, lends itself to creating compelling content. And so it's been interesting in that aspect. But my goodness, it feels like we've been standing in the starting gate, waiting for the starting bell for almost nine months. And now we get to watch them play in a football environment against another team with the wraps taken off, so to speak. Um, there still is that element of we don't know what we're going to see. And that makes it fun and exciting, maybe a little scary to some, but that's one of the reasons I wanted to have Corbin on now uh, to lend some of his insight into that. So here is that discussion that we just had. Corbin Smith from All Seahawks and Locked on Seahawks. Well, Corbin, thanks as always for taking the time to hop on the show. And here's where I want to start because it was almost exactly a year ago that you and I got together for a little camp check-in, in person actually. And I remember one of my biggest takeaways from that interview was at the time you said that the first couple of weeks of that camp last year, which turned out to be Pete Carroll's final camp as Seahawks head coach, were the most intense and physical that you had ever seen as your time as a reporter. So now, <laughs> given what we've seen in practice the last uh, couple of weeks, really, but especially yesterday and this week uh, at the VMAC in Renton, how would you characterize this camp now in relation to that? The two totally different universes. And, you know, I think, I think even from a reporter standpoint, I think that we had gotten used to what a training camp under Pete Carroll looked like. And as last year unfolded, you start to look back and like, yeah, there might've been more, there might've been more padded practices, but there's, there wasn't any emphasis. It felt like on tackling, which showed up on the field last year, unfortunately. 
and the run game not getting to push off the line of scrimmage. So this has just been a different stratosphere in terms of the physicality. And it's not just the extracurriculars. Yes, there's been the fights that's been documented. But like this is my viewpoint, Dan. If you aren't having fights like that by the second, third week in training camp, something's probably not going right. Because guys get sick and tired of hitting their own teammates. You're sick of having to go against the same guys. Adrenaline starts to kick in. Tempers are going to flare. And we didn't see that really last year at Seahawks camp. And there were just more practices where they didn't have pads on. You know, again, I thought last year at this time, compared to what we had seen, it was a much more physical practice uh, set of practices than what we'd seen. But this has just been a different level where you can really tell this team is taking on Mike McDonald's personality. And the, the fact that he had to wait till about the third fight the other day to, before he stepped in, okay, guys, maybe we need to cool down just a little bit. Like, like he's looking for hard asses. That, like, yeah. that's the way. That's what it looks like to me. Like, there, there's a line, but he's looking for that intensity. He's looking for that. It, he's looking for that competitive fervor that is going to end up making fights manifest themselves. Well, could some of that be attributed to the fact that you know, with the new coaching staff, that. Jo jobs are up for grabs. Nobody really is on scholarship. Nobody really has that. Not nobody. There's obviously a couple of players that we know are going to start no matter what, but that there are more positions on the roster where players just don't know their standing and know that they have to impress this new staff in order to get the playing time they want. I think that's a perfect way of putting it. I like the scholarship um, scholarship example there because that's what this feels like. The last couple of years, Pete Carroll and his staff, they knew the guys they had on their roster. And really, when you were going into the season, you felt like there might be three or four spots here that we aren't sure who's going to get those positions. Right now, there are a number of players that I did not even have on the radar for making this football team that have absolutely put themselves in a spot where they, I think, are locks to make this football team. And there seems like there could be a lot of spots at the back end of the roster that – there could be a number of different avenues that this coaching staff decides to go. And I think the players do feel that. I think they understand, hey, unless you were drafted this year by this coaching staff, there's no allegiance here for Mike McDonald and his staff. They're going to put the best 53 players they have out there. And, oh, you were a third-round pick two years ago? whoop de doo We didn't draft you. So I think that that is playing into this, and that's a good problem to have. You want guys to be on the edge knowing, hey, I got to play at my best. I got to bring my best or I might not be on this football team. And so I think it is a good thing. You're seeing a lot of guys that are stepping up because of that. And there's been players like Brady Russell, McLennan Curtis, who might not have been on the radar going into the season where both those guys look to me like they are locks to make this football team at this point. So that's the kind of competition you're seeing here. And I think they got away from that with Pete Carroll. He kept saying always compete, but I just don't feel like the last couple of years that that really was a big part of training camp. This is that always compete mindset where it is manifesting itself into some of these fights because there just is a different level of intensity and spirit out there on the football field right now. Can't wait to get into some of those conversations about guys at the back end of the roster because that's really what preseason is all about, usually from a fan perspective anyway. Uh, but at the top of the roster, uh, another difference between Pete Carroll and Mike McDonald is especially in the last few years, Pete had gotten more and more conservative and even coy about how he would play his starters or even talk about how he was going to play his starters. Mike McDonald came out, was pretty definitive yesterday that his starters, except for mostly on the offensive side of the ball, some guys that have been battling some, some sort of nagging injuries, Geno Smith, not the least among those guys, but that for the most part, starters were going to start. Now, he didn't talk about how much they were going to play. What do you expect to see? I think one, maybe two series. That's what the Baltimore Ravens have done for the last several years. And look, Mike McDonald is modeling a lot of the stuff he's doing based off of what he accomplished in Baltimore and what he learned from John Harbaugh. And look, I can think of a lot of worse things to try to emulate with what the Baltimore Ravens have accomplished there under John Harbaugh. So I'm expecting, particularly on the defense side of the football, at least one series, maybe two. 
Offense, it's going to be a little bit more hit and miss. Geno Smith, he's already said, is not going to be playing in this game. And I think that's the right move to make, regardless of whether he was coming back from an injury or not. I just don't think – I think you think you put your quarterback in bubble wrap. If this was a competition against Sam Howell, that's different. But he is in great command of this offense. Keep him in bubble wrap until you get to week one. Maybe we see one series from him in the third preseason game, but otherwise I don't think he's going to play. Defense is where I'm suspecting that you're going to see most of the starters simply because Mike McDonald wants to see in game action what these projected starters do in his scheme. Now that's player talk. What about playbook? Like how much of the scheme that we're, that we're all so excited to see, right? Not just on defense, which is obviously where Mike McDonald made his, has made his hay, but we're, there's a lot of excitement around Ryan Grubb and what his offense is going to look like moving to the NFL. How much of the playbook are we going to see on Saturday? I think it's going to be your typical preseason game in the sense that it's going to be pretty vanilla. Now, maybe Ryan Grubb's going to try a few more little things out just because this is his first time as an NFL coach, but they are going to be guarded. I mean, they took cell phones away from fans at training camp. They are going to be guarded on what opponents see on preseason film. There's no doubt about that. So uh, particularly on the defensive side of the football, they're going to mix in some different stuff, but they are not going to be running the complex scheme anywhere close to full efficiency because Mike McDonald doesn't want the rest of the league to see all that stuff before September 8th against the Denver Broncos. Now, we haven't seen the newest addition to the roster yet, but we got some clarity yesterday on Connor Williams. It sounds like he's going to arrive beginning of the week or over the weekend anyway, be ready to go next week. But do you get a sense yet um, of what the plan is on, on when we might actually see him on the field and practicing? He has passed a physical, reportedly. His agent says he should be healthy to go week one. And for context, like, We've seen this, and, and in fact, I, I went back and checked today because I keep forgetting how late in the season it was that Jordan Brooks was injured at the end of the 22 season. It was actually New Year's Day that he tore his ACL, and yet we all remember he was out there week one going full speed, starting that first game without a knee brace, no limitations. Connor Williams got hurt at the beginning of December. So do you get a feeling yet for... Uh, the plan that they might have in place to get him up to speed in practice. So I actually was the reporter who asked Mike McDonald yesterday about that. I was just hoping he was going to confirm because you know how this stuff goes with coaches, but he made it very clear that Connor Williams is supposed to be there this weekend and they're still working through a plan. But some of the conversations that I have had on Williams before he even signed with the Seahawks, before that report came out, the couple sources that I talked to indicated he was running full speed. He wasn't wearing a brace. Obviously, he had passed that physical. He passed a physical in Baltimore as well. So I'm anticipating that maybe with limitations, but I'm anticipating that he is going to get some work. It's complicated because next week they're doing joint practices. Yeah. They're not going to just throw him in against the Titans starting defensive line when he hasn't practiced. But I could see him getting some individual work when the Seahawks are down there in Nashville and then the next week they can start to work him into the lineup and see if they can get him rolling. Because again, the sources I've talked to backing up with Drew Rosenhaus was saying about his client, they think he is going to be able to play week one. So now you got to start that process. And the good news is we still got several weeks to get him ready for the start of the season. And again, just for reference, uh, August 15th last year was when Jordan Brooks returned to practice. Uh, Williams coming back certainly would seem to answer one of those questions on the offensive line. And as we start to get those questions answered, it would seem that Lakin Tomlinson is pretty firmly entrenched at this point at left guard. So the big focus now turns to right guard. We're going to talk about right tackle in a second. What do you see? Now you said the starters might only play a series, but, uh, but are we going to see more snaps from the guys that are in competition at spots like that tomorrow? How do you see that snap count kind of working out at that position? Yeah, I look at that right guard position and Anthony Bradford's been getting all the first team reps throughout camp. It doesn't feel like it's really a competition. It's almost been kind of like when Geno Smith and Drew Locke were competing at mm -hmm. the quarterback spot. I mean, Christian Haynes has gotten some first team reps, but they've been at left guard when Lake and Tomlinson 
has been getting veteran rest days. So to this point, we haven't seen that Abe Lucas type rise we saw a few years ago where he overtook Jake Curhan. That that hasn't even been presented as an opportunity for Christian Haynes here to this point. But Bradford still only has 10 starts under his belt. You need to get him some experience in game action in this new offense. So I expect Bradford's going to be one of the offensive starters that gets to play some in this game. And then Christian Haynes will get his opportunities at that right guard spot as well. And then maybe that opens up the competition if Haynes plays really well. But like I said, it just feels like to this point, really, it feels like the third down running back competition is the most intriguing competition Mm -hmm. on the offense side of the ball because Connor Williams, if healthy, you signed him to be your starting center. That competition is now over. And right guard doesn't feel like a competition at this point. And Lincoln Tomlinson is going to be your guy at left guard right now. So it's really much different than I thought it was going to be at this point. I suspected we'd be breaking down a couple of different offensive line competitions. And right now, third down running back seems to be the most exciting one that hasn't been decided yet going to these preseason games. Anything new on Abe Lucas? Unfortunately, I don't have anything new on that front. I was told before training camp started that there was a good chance he was going to be off the pup list pretty quickly. So that has already not happened. That makes me wonder if there's some other things going on. He looks healthy. He's walking around okay, but we haven't gotten to see him run in the field. I've seen Jarek Reed. I've seen Drake Thomas. Some of those guys run, but I've not seen Abe Lucas do any on-field work. So, I don't know where we're at at this point. There were reports last week that he was expected to be ready for the start of the regular season, but the clock is ticking with Abe Lucas. We got to get him on the field and see what he looks like. So maybe that comes next week and maybe he's like Connor Williams and he's doing some work on the side or doing individual drills. I don't know, but at this point, nothing new to update other than he's still on the pup list and doesn't, it remains unclear when he's going to be back. Yeah. George Fant would go in his place, but there seems to be a a new plan for what the next level of backup would be. Uh, Last time we talked, you you told me that McClendon Curtis was a a real storyline and a legit contender at right guard, which we just discussed. Now it seems like he's primarily being used as sort of the backup plan to the backup plan at right tackle behind Fant. He struggled in in the uh, public scrimmage on Saturday and won three and out drive in particular he was kind of picked on three plays in a row what's uh, what's your opinion of him as a right tackle whereas previously we had only talked about him inside yeah I didn't get to attend the mock game so I can't speak to that but I can tell you in a couple of the padded practices this week he was excellent so mm-hmm. you know it's one series guys are going to have that happen sometimes but I've right. been impressed by McClendon Curtis in fact I think he's on this football team I don't think there's any question I don't think he's on the bubble he's the only guy they have that can play both guard and both tackle positions the more you can do the injury situation even if Abe Lucas is back for week one the fact that Curtis can play both guard spots at a high level he can play both tackle positions at a high level he has looked great throughout training camp he dominates in the one-on-one session so Yeah, he might have had one rough series in that mock game, but I have seen a guy that has consistently done a great job in practice. Scott Huff is a big fan of him. You can tell that Scott Huff has great respect for the way that he plays the game. I think Mike McDonald is a big fan of him as well. I mean, Mike McDonald's not one that offers a lot of praise for players during press conferences. I don't know if you've noticed that, but he's pretty guarded when it comes to giving praise for players, but he's been – Pretty positive every time he's been asked about McClendon Curtis. So I think Curtis is very much on this football team as it is. I expect he's going to be the starter at right tackle on Saturday. George Fant, they've been keeping in bubble wrap. He's had three veteran rest days. I'd be surprised if George Fant's playing any snaps in this game. They want to make sure he's okay. McClendon Curtis is going to get a lot of snaps there. We might see him at guard a little bit too because he can play Mm -hmm. both spots with a blindfold on the guy just knows how to play multiple positions, but I expect a lot of snaps for him so that fans can get a more extended look at a player who I think has looked really good throughout training camp really speaks to just all the levels of roster management, you know, and, and, and that one that some people don't think about, he was picked up at the cut to 53 last year as the, the Raiders tried to sneak him onto their practice squad, wanted to do that. And Seahawks swooped in and got him and, kind of hit him on the roster, sort of protected him all year, and, and here we are. are. Are there any other positions at this point in camp uh, without seeing any game action that that you think even you know at the second or third level that we might be a body or two short, that they might be out there sort of 
combing. I know we've seen some moves at nose tackle this week. Any other positions along along the roster that you think they might be looking for some reinforcements at some point? Well, defensive tackle is first. I mean, we've talked about this on the practice field, and Draymond Jones is expected to be back this next week, so that is going to help. But they have been depleted there. There were a couple practices, and I think this is one of the reasons they've done more of these ACT walkthrough practices. Their defensive tackle group has been very thin. There was a couple practices where you looked over the defensive tackle group, and in training camp you're expecting to see 10, 11 guys. We saw five in one of the practices that were just doing drills. It's like that's – that's not normal. That's that's not near enough guys to get through a game. So they've had to add a couple undrafted rookies the last few weeks to the mix of that defensive tackle spot. I think linebacker still remains a position, especially with Jerome Baker missing extended time now with a hamstring injury. That is another position I think the Seahawks are going to be very active looking at the waiver wire when we get to the end of the preseason. I think that is a position that very much is one that they're going to be looking, hey, is there anybody we can get that – is going to be an upgrade at this spot, especially since it doesn't look like Drake Thomas is going to be ready to return for the start of the season. I think if he was ready, maybe it'd be a little bit different situation. And on the offensive side of the football, now that you've got Connor Williams, I don't know that there's going to be any position. I mean, even tight end, the Seahawks have a really nice tight end room that is going to be one that is kind of up in the air, which guys are going to make the team and which guys are going to be practice squatters. So it feels like offense is just much better set than what the defensive side is in terms of depth. They're, they're just deep at every position group, especially now that you've added Connor Williams there, et cetera. They've got a lot of guards that they really like. It's just figuring out what the best combination is. So I think defense is still where they're probably going to be looking to see if they can plug a few gaps. Just a side note, you, you've brought him up a couple of times. He was a guy that I really liked uh, last year when they got him in very much the same way they got McLennan Curtis. They, there was never any uh, confirmation of what Drake Thomas's knee injury was last year. But was it an ACL? Because it sure seems like, given his rehab, that that's, that's the way they're treating it. I still can't answer that for you. And I've tried, I have tried to pick people's brains on this. Nobody will tell me. Mm. I, this is just speculation for me, but I think he had a patellar tendon injury. That okay. that's what I think happened yeah. going back and watching the tape when the injury happened, the way that he landed looked very similar to what happened to Will Disley many years ago, where it was just, you know, just a normal step and then just drop and didn't have his knee like torqued or anything. Like you see a lot of times with guys that have the ACL tear. So right. again, I'm not reporting this. He very well could have done an ACL. Uh, he could have had a couple other ligaments that were damaged, but it looked to me like a patellar tendon thing. And that would make sense with the timeline we're at here because he's way further behind what some of the other guys we've seen coming back from ACL tears have been. So I'm wondering if this is like Trey Brown a few years ago where we're slow playing this because this is just an injury that takes a lot longer to come back from. Seahawks and Chargers kick off tomorrow, Saturday at 4.05 Eastern time at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. Right now, the Seahawks three and a half point favorites. Do you like that action? Do you want to get in on that over under? I know it's kind of tough to set that during the preseason. So many unknowns, but that's what makes it more exciting to some, right? 35 right now, the over under, if you want to play that as well. And if you want to sign up for your bet us account today, you can do that at the link below, get your 125% sign up bonus on your first three deposits up to $2,000 with bet us. So Sam Howell's going to get the start uh, tomorrow. Great opportunity for him. He has had, by all accounts, uh, an up and down training camp. Uh, started slow, but it seems like most of the reporting is that he's looked better in practice um, the last few days, in particular, after kind of having a rough a rough day again on Saturday. What what's your viewpoint about his progression to this point? I think this week he took a big step forward, and it was tougher to tell. From the standpoint, his receivers were letting him down. Like, I believe it was Wednesday's practice. Actually, no, it was Tuesday's practice. It was Tuesday's practice. D. Eskridge dropped not one, but two touchdowns during the team session that were perfectly thrown. I think one of the best throws we've seen all of training camp was the first one. Eskridge was going down the seam, and he had split the two safeties. And Hal threw a bullet over the middle, and it was perfectly placed. And it ended up looking like a field goal because the ball went right through D Eskridge's hands. I don't think he touched it. I don't think he got a piece of it. So that was not a good look for D Eskridge. And then two snaps later, Artie Burns was all over Eskridge, but Howell lofted a ball into the back right-hand corner 
and it was placed perfectly. He got it over Artie Burns' hand, and it bounced off the chest of Eskridge, and he didn't catch it. So he has been hurt by receiving uh, letdowns throughout training camp. The accuracy has been a problem, but this week it felt like he had really cut down on those airmailed throws. He was much more in command. He looks more comfortable in this offense. And then we get to see on Wednesday, had a 35-yard touchdown to LaVisca Chenault that was perfectly thrown. It was good coverage by Nehemiah Pridgett, but it was just a better throw by Sam Howell, leading the speedy receiver. Brady Russell, he hit on the seam, very similar route to what D. Eskridge had. And Brady Russell actually caught the damn football. So he got himself another touchdown. So you're starting to see him start to figure things out. He and Chenault have a really good connection going here. Over the last week, um, he's got a connection with Brady Russell. He and Aesop Winston have had some success in this training camp. So, look, the reality is he, he has not looked good most of this training camp. And there's a incredibly wide chasm between him and Geno Smith. I don't think he's done much to close that because Geno Smith just looks that good, for one thing. But I do think you are seeing you're seeing Sam Howell really – start to embrace this offense and be more comfortable in it. He's getting more comfortable with the receivers. We have to remember he hadn't played with any of these guys when he came yeah. to Seattle. Geno Smith knew most of these players. So he had that built-in advantage learning this offense with guys he already knew from playing with. So I do think we're seeing positive progress. And Sam is a guy that I think fits the, the mold of a gamer. So I'm really curious to see what he ends up doing on Saturday. So you might have given away part of this answer with how often you've named a particular player, but the preseason is kind of set up for unsung stars and guys to kind of step, step out of the shadow and make names for themselves and, and that sometimes exceed their ability, right? Legends are born in the preseason. Uh, it, it, we've the seen Troy it. Troy Popes of the world. And the, the, I, got, I got a list here. Nick Reed. Cason Williams, obviously, was a huge source of contention when the Seahawks didn't put him on their final 53 after a huge preseason one year. Mike Teal one year had people thinking he was a future franchise quarterback. Uh, we're seeing buzz this morning in New England about Joe Milton's performance yesterday, even though they drafted Drake May with the, you know, with the top three pick. Who are some guys on this roster that, that you think that the, the, uh, the environment of the preseason game kind of sets up for them to stand out and look like stars? Well, I'm going to start at the running back position because George Halani has been, I'm not going to say he's been a revelation because I liked him at Boise State. I thought he was a really good player. He had some injury issues that I think led to him going undrafted. But right now, I think George Halani is ahead of Kenny McIntosh for the third down running back job. I, it feels like the momentum is on his side. Now, McIntosh could very easily jump back over him with a good preseason. So both those guys there's a lot of pressure on them. I can see Seattle carrying four running backs and both those guys are there. But if you want to get offensive snaps on Sundays, right now, George Halani is the player who feels like he has gained traction. I thought Ryan Grubbs answered the other day when I asked about the third down competition. He immediately was talking about Halani and Raven about him and then said Kenny McIntosh hasn't been up to snuff with pass protection. That seemed mm. pretty alarming to me that he mentioned that. So it feels like Halani's got that advantage. You want to talk about a guy that runs with his pads, man. He is fun. He lowered the boom on Nehemiah Pritchett, and I think it probably took him a few minutes to get Pritchett off the turf because he just planted him running the ball. He's had two or three really nice touchdowns. He's been good in pass protection. He plucks the ball out of the air like a receiver. You know, he doesn't get the Kenny McIntosh label as a receiver, but he's got just as good of hands. Maybe you can't move him around as much in the formation, but he he can catch the football. Three drops his entire college career at Boise State. He had 88 wow. catches for the Broncos. So he is that three-tool running back. He's not the athlete that Ken Walker the third is, but, I mean, he can do all three of those things effectively. So, you know, Troy Main Pope had that in amazing preseason. I yep. think that George Halani could be that player here. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Halani actually doesn't get as many opportunities because the Seahawks just want to see a little bit and then protect him for the rest of the preseason. Hmm. Uh, and you've mentioned Brady Russell as a guy, and he really stood out another practice squad poaching last year. So some yep. of these, you know, this this coaching staff might send a couple of thank you cards to the previous one for some of the guys that kind of slid I, over I've got another name for you, and this is going to be interesting on defense. Uh, okay. Marquise Blair. 
You know, I, I you know, I think a lot he of people lying around on Saturday. I'll tell you that a lot of people when that signing was made, a lot of people were like, oh, this is just a depth signing. And I kind of looked at it as that way, too. But, you know, all the injuries he's had, I can tell you two things that have stood out. He can still move. He does not look like the injuries have sapped him of his athleticism. He can still fly. And sometimes to his detriment, but the dude, the dude has absolutely no fear. I mean, he goes out and just smacks people. And the other day there was a play where I don't know why I always forget the guy's name, the Florida Atlantic running back that, that I also think I could have listed here, but he had a 59 yard touchdown run. And on that play, Marquise Blair was in pursuit and LaVisca Chenault was trying to come back to block him. And Blair was so nonchalant looking too. Like it wasn't like he was like lower in his head or anything. He just kind of lowered his shoulder and just, he trucked over LaVisca Chenault. Like all of us were just like, Oh my God. Like that's just the kind of style Marquise Blair plays with. So he doesn't look to me like the injuries have sapped him of any of that stuff. He's, he still looks very athletic. He still looks like he can hit with the best of them on the roster he looks like he has a pretty good idea of what to do in this defense too. He's been getting some second team reps occasionally. So Marquise Blair is a player, not just because he's going to be hitting people really hard, but like he could play himself onto the roster in these preseason games as a backup safety. And I don't just want to spend all the time talking about potential sleeper guys. We can't just ignore the number 16 overall pick in the draft, right? We've <laughs> heard, we've almost taken him for granted already. You know, the people report about how great he looks every day, but now he gets a chance to, to maybe even play some extended snaps after the starters and, and really wreak some havoc against some backup offensive linemen. And we could see Byron Murphy just like a bowling ball out there, right? I think he's going to be starting in this game because as far as defensive players who I don't think are going to play, I just don't see value for Leonard Williams or Jaron Reed playing in this game. Yeah. So I could see Byron Murphy being one of the interior starters. He's going to get a lot of snaps and he needs them. Look, he's a rookie. He's got to get this game experience, but I can't wait to see him in full pads without any limitations because this guy he is that rolling ball of butcher knives. Like the, the guy just <laughs> his penetrating ability. I filmed this at training camp and you can find it on my X account. It's you'd have to scroll down some, cause this was, I think this was late last week, but Mike Morris and Byron Murphy were doing back to back. They were doing a drill where they were, they were working on rip moves and dip rip and dip on pads. And it felt like, and Mike Morris is not the same athlete, so I, I don't want people to, you know, misconstrue this, but, like, Mike Morris is still a really athletic dude at 6'5", 300 pounds. It felt like I turned my iPhone on, like, one quarter speed for the first part of the video because Mike Morris went, got through the drill, and then Byron Murphy just shot out of a cannon. Like, he just, there's just dudes that move different, and Byron Murphy is that player, so... The chance to see that, the bull rushes we've seen in one-on-ones, uh, the ability to stonewall dudes, take on double teams. He's shown all that in training camp, so I cannot wait to see it in a situation where he can get off blocks and actually tackle dudes because I have a feeling we're going to get a really fun taste in L.A. of what this guy is capable of doing. Yeah, I get it. I, I said at the beginning of camp, I've never really been impressed, and, and it's not set up for you to be impressed, but by someone's blocking sled work. But I've never I've never been as uh, blown away by watching someone work a blocking sled as I have watching Byron Murphy. It's it's impressive. I mean, you see every you see the strength, you see the pop, you see the quickness, you see, yeah, he's uh, uh he is the complete package. Like uh, you know, there's a lot of hype, but I think he is going to live up to it. I mean, I I literally. Dan, the first practice we get to watch him at rookie mini camp. There's just some guys like last year, Devin Witherspoon, the first look we got is like that dude's just different. Byron Murphy, the second, is in that same mold. We're just like that guy is just different. Yeah. Uh, while I've got you, after the Chargers, they go to Nashville next week, and not just for the game on Saturday, but a couple days prior for joint practices, something we haven't seen around here in a very long time. Uh, you're going to head out there with, with the team and cover those practices. There's tons of storylines there with Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams. Uh, tell us about kind of what you're looking forward to seeing in that environment. Yeah, I just want to see – 
legitimate reps on the practice field because this is this has been my biggest issue with Pete Carroll the last four or five years. Why he did not embrace the idea of joint practices when he wasn't giving his starters reps in preseason games. I don't feel like you can do both of those things. Your guys are not going to be ready for the season. So the chance for this offensive line to go up against Jeffrey Simmons, like that is probably what I'm most excited about. I want to see how does this offensive line hold up against a defensive line that's got a top five defensive tackle. I want to see what that looks like. I want to see DK Metcalf and the rest of that receiving core going against the Titans cornerbacks, the one-on-ones. And I want to see the overall physicality. Does it translate against another football team in an environment where you can control the narrative a little bit more than you can in a preseason game. You can control the tempo. You can control when the whistle blows. And so we really will get to see some awesome full contact hitting to an extent with starters going against starters. And I've just been wanting them to do joint practices for years. I never understood why they avoided it like the plague. And the fact Mike McDonald came in year one. All right, we're going to set this up. Let's, let's get a joint practice set up. I just think these reps are incredibly valuable for starters that quite frankly are not going to get many opportunities if any in the preseason at some point you've got to get some actual hitting against top competition this is going to provide that opportunity i'm going to throw a bonus question out there to finish on you and i don't talk about fantasy football or that perspective but it's that time of year i find myself doing 10 mock drafts a day already kind of gearing up but when you look at this seattle offense if you're someone that's that's looking for you know fantasy value is are there a couple guys that stand out that you think might be poised for big years that are going to provide big return for someone who drafts them in fantasy football or do you think there's too many unknowns not knowing how ryan grubb's going to deploy his offense maybe too many weapons being on hand where he's going to spread the wealth and it's not going to lend itself to someone really having that kind of value i'll give you two players actually i'll give you three that i think are going to have fantasy value dk metcalf it has been obvious throughout camp I, ryan grubb knows what he's got there ryan grubb is going to take those shots to him in, the, in this explosive offense i'm not saying dk goes for 1500 yards i don't think there's gonna be enough touches there but i could see him get close to what he did a couple years ago when he set the franchise record i could see him score a lot more touchdowns seems like he's been more effective in the red zone in these practices that we've gotten a chance to watch And he and Geno Smith, you're three together. You can just tell that the guys, it's almost telepathic at this point. I know what you're going to do. I'm going to throw the football to you. So Metcalf would be the first one. If you're in a league where you're looking at reception points, Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be somebody that you should be drafting early because I'm sticking with my prediction that I made a month ago. I think Jackson Smith and Jigba leads this team in catches this year. He is (laughs) going to be utilized attacking the middle of the field. His average depth of target isn't going to be two point whatever yards it was last year. And Grubbs actually have him doing those intermediate routes that he is so good at. Geno Smith is throwing the football to him a ton. I think that's going to carry into the games. And Ken Walker the third, I was kind of torn on this a week ago, but like the more that I'm hearing, Kennedy Palomalu is in love with Ken Walker the third. If Kennedy Mm -hmm. Palomalu, look at the track record, he's had a couple rushing title winners, recently Josh Jacobs if he's got a guy that he thinks has that kind of talent he's going to get his carries he's going to get his opportunities this offensive line looks like it's going to be better in the run game at least to this point that's what it looks like they're going to be more physical and Ken Walker the third has added a little bit of muscle to his frame I think a big season could be coming for Ken Walker the third so those would be the three players that I would outline if you're looking from a fantasy perspective that could have really good value Nice. I'm taking notes as a defending champion. I'm drafting at the 12-1 turn, so I'm going to need to find some value there. Yeah, I think JSN might be your best bet in that regard. I just did. I don't know if the touchdowns are going to be interesting with him, but I just think Geno Smith is going to be throwing to him a lot. Listen, before I let you go, I just want to say this. When you and I first started uh, interacting on Twitter many years ago now, you were a guy that was writing a little bit and doing film breakdowns. And to see where you've gotten to now, one of the hardest working guys out there, uh, you know, making yourself one of the most recognizable beat reporters in Seattle this year, doing a lot more television uh, locally and some live TV and even on some national shows. Uh, Just want to say kudos to you, proud of you. Uh, Love seeing what you're doing. And I appreciate that even now, even, even though you're a big shot, you still take some time to hop on the show. 
Uh, I don't consider myself a big shot, and man, I remember. Let's see, that's the secret to your success. I learned this. Hey, my dad. My dad was a farmer, man, and my mom's a family doctor. Like I learned from a young age, like you treat everybody the same. You're not better than anybody else. You get your feet. You get your feet down. You get you get, get down and dirty, and you get to work. So like that's. That's just the way that I do things. And, uh, you know, I, I owe my parents for that because if I wouldn't have done that, um, for one thing, my dad, the Vietnam vet, would have taken care of that very quickly. <laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate the kind words, man. But uh, there's always a place for uh, chatting with you and, and all the other people out there. I try to make myself available to anybody because I remember what it was like when I was first coming up too. Everybody just wants the opportunity to talk football. So uh, I don't. I don't consider myself a big shot and I, I'm never going to adopt that kind of a mentality. So outstanding. You can read his stuff on all Seahawks. You can watch or listen to him and watch him on locked on Seahawks and uh, Corbin Smith NFL is your Twitter handle. I believe at Corbin Smith NFL uh, Corbin. Thanks again for taking the time. We'll catch up again soon. Sounds good, man. Take it easy. All right. I will not be able to re- react immediately after the game uh, on Saturday night. So I won't have a live reaction as I will throughout the regular season. Um, some of those will be immediate when the Seahawks play on the road. Um, I will be going live as soon as possible at the end of the game. Home games I attend. And so, you know, however long it takes me to get back, throw some notes together and come to you. But those reaction shows this year, last year, there were some of them were live this year. The plan is for all of them to be live. That way you can interact and engage and ask questions and give your opinions on what you're seeing. But uh, it won't be until Sunday that I'll be able to react to the game. I'm going to have to rewatch it. Um, and then uh, I'll let you know what I think about what we see on the field and then head into next week and get ready for the week two contest and joint practices against the Tennessee Titans and our old friends, uh, Quandary Diggs and Jamal Adams. That'll be fun. Thanks again to Corbin at Corbin Smith NFL for joining me on the show. Thanks again to BetUS for sponsoring this program. I'm Dan Vienge. You can follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks.